This conference will now be recorded. We are recording and I call this meeting to order. Uh, I'm sure all of you poured over the last meeting's minutes. I had a look and didn't see anything that really popped out in that. Uh, does anybody have any additions or, or uh, corrections to the last meeting's minutes? Silence, good in this case. It looks good. All right, so let's uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, launch into it. Um, let's we're going to start with a COVID relief funding. And Ron, uh, can you give us a summary of that? Or yes, sir, Mr. Deborah on here. I I don't know if if uh, you want to pass the baton to her or what. And yeah. I appreciate you being with us, CEO Johnson. Yes, thank you, Deborah. Good to good to see you this morning, Mr. Chair. I'll maybe just start since this is sort of a little bit of a continuation from um, the previous um, meeting, and then um, certainly, if you're um, willing, would um, ask Ms. Johnson to to weigh in as well, since I think we we have a bit more information since the since the last meeting that uh, came to light just over a week ago. Um, so just by way of reminder from the last meeting, um, the 2021 Omnibus Appropriations Bill that was passed by Congress towards the end uh, in December um, and became effective December 27th included some additional um, coronavirus uh, relief funding. Um, the lovely acronym ERRSAA, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. Um, um, FT, the Federal Transit Administration, FTA, did um, a week ago, Monday, I believe, release the apportionment table for those funds um, between the Boulder and Denver Aurora um, urban areas, RTD. Uh, is slated to receive approximately $203 million um, through that supplemental appropriation for COVID relief funding. So that's in the staff memo. Um, again, RTD received about $232 million in federal CARES Act funding in 2022 and has now spent all of that money. Um, as a result of their um, uh, cost cutting uh, measures, um, uh, described there and the additional CARES Act funding, uh, reducing service and so forth, um, RTD was able to retain all of its staff through 2020 um, and add about um, $80 million to mm -hmm. um, our reserve funds. Um, obviously, in anticipation of continued declines in ridership uh, as the pandemic uh, winds down, hopefully. Um, and we get a handle on that, reduced fare box revenues, reduced sales and use tax receipts. Um, RTD did adopt its 2021 budget uh, built on continued service level of about 60% of pre-pandemic levels uh, and a reduction of approximately 400 positions, uh, most filled, some vacant. Um, and then, and I believe, and, and Ms. Johnson can confirm that those uh, reductions have now been effectuated uh, by RTD, if not entirely uh, in large part. Um, the 2021 budget is a $1.66 billion budget, a reduction of $125 million from the amended 2020 RTD budget, um, and did not assume any additional uh, COVID relief funds uh, beyond the CARES Act. So this 203, uh, approximately million dollars of COVID uh, relief funding is in addition to RTD's anticipated revenues that they built the 2021 budget on. So uh, we did just list some, some questions uh, for the committee just to get some discussion started. Uh, but I think based on the finance uh, subcommittee discussions and the accountability committee uh, discussions previously, there was an interest in trying to kind of continue this conversation, see if the accountability committee wanted to address any particular suggestions or recommendations to RTD as it works through the monumental task of figuring out sort of how to utilize uh, the these additional COVID relief uh, funds. So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, be happy to hand it off to uh, 
CEO Johnson if she wants to make some remarks and then to the to you and the subcommittee for discussion. Great. And we do have some ideas that we think might uh, be beneficial in in uh, supporting some of the things that we've, we've been working on that uh, we, we would like to have the chance to discuss with you uh, as well. But let me turn it over to you, CEO Johnson. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity and good morning to all of the accountability uh, finance subcommittee members. Um, I am Deborah Johnson, General Manager and CEO, and it is my pleasure to provide you with a status of where we are as it relates to the CRRSA fund. Recognizing what Mr. Pastorf has said that we learned on January 11th, what the apportionment was for the urbanized areas, via notification of USDOT. Um, what we have done internally, I have convened my team, uh, recognizing that the intent of those funds were put forth to ensure the retainment of frontline employees, recognizing that we had effectuated layoffs of um, approximately 200 uh, filled positions, recognizing that the other savings that we were able to endure came from vacant positions in which we eliminated. Hence, there was a cost savings that was brought forth from that action. So with that as a backdrop, I wanted to share with you that we are in the process of recalling our represented employees. We are adhering to the tenants of the collective bargaining agreement in which the Regional Transportation District has with the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 10001. Pursuant to that process, we have uh, disseminated uh, certified letters to those employees that were released. They range from bus and rail operators to uh, rail mechanics. Um, as related to that, there is a process pursuant to the agreement I just specified that there is 15 days in which they can respond. Quite naturally, as part of the process, we have to ensure people come back and they have to take a drug and alcohol test. So we're in process. I should have an understanding of the full complement of individuals that we have returning to be in the seat um, next week. It is my intent to brief the RTD board on where we stand with those activities. More specifically, as relates to the language in the legislation that was effectuated on December 27th by the former president, um, we are eliminating furloughs and leveraging the money to the extent that the bill text specified. Moreover, what we're in the process of doing, recognizing that there are monies and we need to supplement service as it relates to bringing back employees. We want to ensure that we are uh, leveraging them to lessen the burden in, in reference to the service that we are currently providing. We are looking to respond to overloads, considering that we have current COVID level service, recognizing current social distancing protocols. Um, we also are looking to leverage um, uh, school trippers, um, in, in relationship to some certain routes and to look at open runs in which we will utilize. Um, I want to be careful at what I say at this juncture because we're in the process of working in tandem with the Algamated Transit Union about what we're going to do going forward. So I don't want to speak outside of where we are in relationship to how we're going to incorporate people back in. But what I will say, uh, we will be at a point in which I can share that in quick order, but we want to ensure that we're leveraging um, our, our complement of individuals coming back in a manner uh, which will be a benefit to those that most need transit service. Um, additionally, what I am working on staff with as well, looking at how we can supplement some of the ancillary service that we provide, meaning that looking at providing some funds to other transit providers in which we partner with here in the area. Um, I'm not at a place right now since this conversation just ensued last evening with my senior leadership team where I can give specifics because the first step in this equation, recognizing we still have yet to receive the guidance from FTA is to ensure that we're recalling employees. So um, that's what I have at this time, what I intend to do at the RTD board meeting on the 26th recognizing that I should have some of these, um, uh, not questions, but some of these things that I talked about have more information relative to our uh, 
collaboration with the union, and then in turn looking at what our service delivery model could be because that's all predicated upon how many bodies we have because just for everyone's edification in reference to transit service delivery, first you start with the schedule, then you start with the vehicle you need for said schedule, and then how many people you need, and it goes on from there. So that's the piece that we are working on right now. Um, I do plan as well to give a briefing to the board, as I said, on January 26th, and then uh, basically come back to the board at a special uh, finance committee meeting on February 2nd, where I could be more specific in relationship to how we are allocating these funds. So at this juncture, I will yield the floor to my colleague, our acting CFO, Doug McLeod, um, to offer him the opportunity, opportunity to share anything that he believes is germane in reference to what I said, especially from the process of utilizing the fund. So, Mr. McLeod. Doug. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Rudd. Uh, yeah, I think Deborah hit on all the points. Um, obviously, we have a lot of issues to consider. So this is additional one-time funding that we will be receiving. Um, we are still closing out our year-end financials for 2020 and need to get a better idea of how we ended up um, in terms of our final balances and reserves. So all of those things are kind of coming together all at once that we will have to take into consideration um, and inform Deborah of to take to the board, just so we can get a full picture of, of what the our financial position is at this point in time, as well as the outlook going forward. And uh, that's really all I had to add to what Deborah said. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from our board? Our committee members, Elise. I just wanted to make sure I heard Deborah correct that of the 400 positions that have been discussed, only 200 of them are f were filled, and that um, you're in the process of bringing back all 200. Is that? Did I understand what you said, or did I butcher that? Um, no, no. Let me clarify something. So, approximately 400 positions. Um, as it relates to frontline positions, I want to say I didn't have a firm number. I, I want to say we're bringing back all of those represented positions, recognizing that some were non-represented and we made the determination based upon our core business being transit service delivery. Some of those positions will not be brought back because some of those were eliminated. Some were vacated already and some were filled. So to qualify that, there's individuals that are remaining um, that, you know, uh, had to take furlough days. So we're eliminating furlough days pursuant to what the statute said. So I hope that clarifies. I don't have the specific numbers as of yet. Um, our HR team, along with Mr. McLeod, they're working to give me those numbers so we know what we're working with because during the recall process, um, an individual could say that he or she is not interested in returning. Perhaps they found another job or for other reasons. So um, it's our intent to recall all of the frontline positions that are represented. Um, I and can't. Okay, is sorry. Is that 200? Sorry to interrupt. Is that the, where the 200 figure comes from? Is that that's the number of? Yeah, plus or minus, approximately. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And are all of those represented positions, the people that you're bringing back, are all of them in the represented category? Uh, yes, and the reason why there's some hesitancy is because I'm evaluating one anomaly, and I, at this time, I don't feel comfortable in sharing that in this public setting, but there could be one um, or two non-represented non -represented positions that are germane to the overall arching aspect of delivering service. Certainly. Okay. We won't put you on that. <laughs> okay. And I will be more than happy once we flesh that out to ensure that I provide that information to you all. I just don't want to get ahead of myself recognizing that I haven't had the opportunity to speak with the board and I am having an all hands meeting tomorrow with RTD employees. So I want to ensure that I'm doing my due diligence and apprising them and they're not hearing about things uh, second and third hand. Absolutely. They should hear Thank first. Thank you very much. Okay, Elise, I know that we both had some ideas that we wanted to put forward in terms of the, the COVID, new COVID funding and, and how it might be used to benefit. Um, you should go ahead and start with yours and then I'll, I'll finish up. I think okay. those are, isn't that the order of the memo that you kind of put in? I think it'll be easier to follow. Okay, 
I, I did send out a revised version of it too. It, it the the one that's in the minutes will be will will have updated. But okay. um, the I the idea here, CEO Johnson, is uh, there there are some things that if we if we look at where we are in this before everything's allocated, we'd like to make some suggestions of things that you might fund that could have a significant impact, for example, on ridership. And a lot of my focus has been ridership because fundamentally that's the thing that makes mass transit worthwhile for, for funding from a state level even and from the legislature. It's how many people can we carry and and it is also from a COVID perspective, one of the things that's been most severely impacted. Uh, but uh, there are two, really two recommendations, and this ties into the COVID vaccination process. What can RTD do that would really have a positive impact on COVID vaccinations, and at the same time, be something that could, could help us grow ridership for RTD? And so, uh, the first recommendation is that it, it's strictly to do with, with RTD basically is going to benefit a lot from whenever we finally achieve that sort of uh, kind of immunization, herd immunization levels that we may be able to get to. But to, to put it, to try to cut down the, <laughs> the discussion a little bit, there are two parts. The first part is to provide free transportation to people that are going to get vaccinations. And, uh, and it's sort of the equivalent of a day pass for anyone who has proof that they are registered to get a vaccination. Now, as Dan pointed out to me, one of our committee members, uh, it, it, it's a bad thing if the, if the drivers have to be the referees of whether or not they should get their free ride or not for that day. So instead of that, it's sort of an honor system where they say, okay, I'm getting vaccinated today. They're supposed to carry with them either on their on their smartphones or a paper copy of something that says they are registered. Uh, but um, but in in essence, it is let's give them a free ride to to the clinic if uh, if RTD is part of the pathway of how they get there. Uh, that's not a big, uh, that's not, I think, a real big ask. The bigger ask is the idea that for people that get vaccinated, we would give them what is in essence uh, 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 a pass that will allow them to use RTD uh, until three days after they're supposed to get their second vaccination. And then if they show up for the second vaccination, they get an additional 15 days of free ridership. So, Part of this is to try to create a situation where these folks can uh, effectively uh, get a real sample rather than just a ride, a single ride of, of riding RTD and hope to get some of these people in the habit of riding RTD and have the, some of the people who have quit riding RTD come back to riding RTD. And, uh, and so those are the two parts of the proposal. In, in essence, a sh it, it is a short term, it's like giving a month pass, but it's a little less than that in some cases. But it's like giving a month pass uh, to people who are getting vaccinated. Obviously, uh, it is an incentive for Coloradans in the district to get vaccinated. And that's a positive thing from the standpoint of our relationship to the governor and to the legislature and to the Biden administration, who are all very centered and focused on how are we gonna get everybody vaccinated. Uh, it will have some cost to uh, RTD, but if we can get some people back riding again that weren't riding before, that increase in ridership is one of the ways, assuming the legislative changes go through, that RTD is really gonna be measured by the legislature. And so we, we are very focused on how we build ridership. This is essentially uh, a benefit to people that get vaccinated disguised as a trial ridership program. So that's, uh, that's the summary of it. I've got details on it. I'll be happy to send to you.
So, Mr. Chair, I want to say thank you so much for that. Um, I appreciate that wholeheartedly, and it's something that I have been considering as well. And let me qualify my statement. So, I have a meeting scheduled this Friday with Jill Ryan, the Executive Director of Colorado Public Health Department and the Environment, and it's qualified as a brainstorming session because we are meeting to discuss about how we can partner. And um, there's going to be a couple of people involved with that discussion on Friday. Uh, we were talking about the same just via email. So we have yet to meet and come together with these ideas. But we were talking about something along these lines as well, because if it's done collaboratively, when people are scheduling appointments for vaccination, we could probably help you know, facilitate that. It could be a multi-pronged approach that I'm open to hearing whereby we are focused on certain uh, disenfranchised communities that need to get there as well. Um, and then what you offer up is, is something to consider. Um, I had not thought about thereafter in relationship to, you know, a, a 30 day pass per se, but we could look at costing of that, recognizing that we make assumptions going forward about what that may be contingent upon the test sites and things along those lines. So I wanna thank you for uh, your thoughtfulness and creativity in, in reference to putting forward these recommendations. As soon as we're all done here, I'll send you an email that will have the attachment that describes okay. this. I fleshed it out. It's a straw man. It's up to RDD, RKD, of course. Right. Our committee makes recommendations, and, and this isn't officially a recommendation of the accountability committee because it hasn't gone through that whole process. But speed is of the essence for something no, like no, that. understood and i mean it, it's great to hear that we're all traveling in the same lane in reference to these ideas so thank you so much you bet elise you're on sure and i thanks rut and thanks deborah i had sent an email to rut i think and, and the committee members i don't know a week or so ago and and um also afforded that to deborah as well again brainstorming thoughts um to uh facilitate the conversation we're having today. So um, similar to RUT, thinking about um, really boosting ridership, looking at um, both fares and passes. And um, on, the, on the fare side, um, suggested piloting a reduced flat fare, a dollar or $2 for, for, for as long as we can up to six months, which would be the, the where you'd have to um, do your equity analysis, but to try to both rebuild ridership um, to pre-COVID levels and attract new riders. And the idea would be that, it, you know, it's simple um, and it's a big enough price difference that um, it would be useful to, to transit reliant essential workers who are still riding RTD and might be able to to uh, bring back new people who might think, oh, gee, that's a lot cheaper than parking. So that's one. The other is also recognizing, you know, the operations um, subcommittee is going to be um, submitting recommendations around how to improve the past programs, and there's going to be a lag time there. So what can we do in the interim? Um, one is to try to in, uh, help um, speed up expanded enrollment in the LIV program um, to help Right now, that's that's really happening from um, uh, HHS workers, at, you know, in, in the various counties. Um, how can we help um, assist them to make that happen? Um, uh, also, looking at trying to provide more flexibility in the EcoPass program, um, allowing master contracts, providing a better option for businesses. Again, so that people are investing in transit now while we're trying to build ridership. Um, also looking at leveraging um, new partnerships and new ideas on on how to build back in some of the service cuts and um, so these are and I listed in my um, the email some of the uh, innovative discussions that are happening now that I'm aware of and there's probably others in the system I mentioned that taxi voucher program that's happening between the town of Lyons and Boulder now, which the Boulder County would co-fund to, that would allow RTD to provide some of that lost service since that route's been cut. 
but doing it in a much uh, cheaper way and leveraging local dollars to participate in that. Um, there's also some um, some uh, innovation uh, being considered around some flex ride services. So looking at those partnerships with local communities that can leverage local dollars and provide more cost effective for smaller vehicle service in places that have experienced cuts. Um, I also flag the importance of working with other transit service providers in providing some of that funding so that we don't have to cut those contracts um, any more than um, necessary. So those are sort of the, the um, big areas of thinking around trying to improve, use some of this funding to improve ridership. Yes. Thank you, if I may. Thank you so much, Elise, for that. I, I appreciate that and um, did receive this from you. And and I share, um, I, I share the same belief in reference to some of these things that we can do. And, and you and I, in the interest of full disclosure, I, I said that we'd be willing to leverage, you know, some pilot programs. Um, and I wanted just to say for the record, yes, that we are thinking along those lines. And I talked to my team about sharing some of the federal stimulus with the other transit providers in the metro area. I think there is an opportunity for us to look at some of the passes as relates to what we could yield going forward. So I want to state that we are open to that as I work with my um, internal team here. And that once, to Doug's point, we do the year in and flesh everything, we can see. I want to say this, I'm not making any promises because I'm speaking outside of this, but perhaps, you know, in reference to getting that stimulus money and what we were doing with uh, payroll and things like that, perhaps we could swap that out and utilize monies that will enable us to leverage some of these things that don't fall under the auspices of that legislation. But as I said, we have to examine that. And Doug, would you support that or tell me if I'm speaking out of the side of my neck? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Mr. Chair, may I go ahead? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. We have to look at the whole picture and what we have available. We have um, a lot of demands in terms of uh, funding needs uh, with things that were delayed, et cetera. So yeah, the, it'll, we'll have to take a look at the, the entire picture and then what we have, what the parameters are for the funding availability that's been given us versus what we have already budgeted and consider them both together. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Madam Co-Chair. Very good. Any other uh, comments or suggestions from the committee before we move on? I had one question, Rut. Is there going to be a process to sort of formally submit something to RDD, RTD with, we're throwing out ideas. Do we want to hone them and get the committee support for a small number of priority recommendations that we send to RTD sometime in the next handful of weeks or month. What do you what are your thoughts on the process? I think we really do need to do that with, with these that are priorities. Uh, Rebecca, I see you going like this. Yeah. I take that as a good <laughs> side. There, there, there are some of these things. One of the things we'll talk about at the end of, of our meeting today are the priorities going forward and timing for those and when we can get some of those things done. But I think we have a few things that need to be able to jump the queue. And uh, if we're going to do something that's going to have an impact early and that involves some of this uh, COVID funding money, we need we need to raise our hands sooner rather than later. So yes, uh, I, as far as a process for that, I really think we need to get it in front of the RT, the full committee. Uh, I don't know what the best way to do that is. The other way we could do it is we could send it out. I know that we've had feedback from a lot of these the people on the main committee. We could send it out and say, you know, do you support or do you oppose this idea? And um, oh, Mr. Chair, your, yes, your 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 Dr. Cog staff has some concern with subcommittees and the accountability committee deliberating via email. Um, uh, I think I, I, I would suggest that um, some feedback today from the subcommittee on all these brainstormed ideas would be helpful. And if you want to maybe have designate a couple of subcommittee members to refine these, uh, and if your request is to put um, the question 
at the next full RTD Accountability Committee, if that's your time frame for trying to get these recommendations finalized and to RTD, maybe that would be an approach that you might want to consider. I I agree with you and thank you. You're you're uh, you always tend to keep me out of trouble, Ron, and I appreciate that. So uh, so let's say that one of the things we want to try to do today is look through these and see which ones we want to move forward. Who will take ownership? of those and how we will how we will uh get them ready when is that meeting ron the next oh, full I, I knew you would ask me that yeah. <laughs> give me one second yeah i've got it on my calendar but that's on another screen february 8th february 8th mr chair february 8th. um i i still think we should go ahead and send the preliminary versions of these uh for consideration with the understanding that they're not blessed by the full committee. But meanwhile, I think we need to get things ready for the full committee and flesh these out a little more. Elise, I assume you'll take ownership for the ones that are on your side? I certainly can, but I would like to get some feedback on, I think we have more recommendations than we do um, <laughs> Certainly, than our to implement done. them. So it would be helpful to hear from subcommittee members. Yeah. Um, if we have time, just on which ones they think are worthy of of um, taking to the next level. Right. Well, some of these are, are really hard to digest in the amount of time that we have in a meeting like this. Um, I struggle with how to do that, but as long as we limit ourselves to fleshing them out and they're going to be discussed in the larger uh, RTD Accountability Committee meeting then there will be the opportunity there for anyone who uh who basically falls into that category of wanting to come in and say something about it uh or or make uh comments about it there are communities of interest in all of these things and uh uh we have a provision for some input from them in our general meeting so let's let's uh plan on trying to flesh out these ideas and decide today who's going to do the fleshing out. Rebecca, I saw your thumbs up. Is there something in particular uh, of, of all these proposals that you're uh, passionate about getting moved forward sooner rather than later? There's some that I thought, hey, I'll try to get Rebecca to do this. <laughs> you might take the lead on. Um, no, I'm I'm happy to help. Um, I I think we actually all of these are great ideas. You know, I would I would probably fold in the the drum I keep beating around um, transparency around what RTD ultimately decides is their priority areas, mm -hmm. um, and so I'd I'd like to include that. Uh, but otherwise, how, however, I can help advance the the communication. I'm happy to happy to do that. Great. I had you penciled in for for the transparency dashboard. <laughs> Thanks. <idea>. Thanks. <laughs> Wanted to talk about that a little more too later on at the end of the meeting, but we do have an agenda. And uh, I think we're probably about uh, ready to move on to our next issue, which is debt. Always a joyful issue. Um, and and I asked, had asked Ron uh, some time back, Ron, would you unmic yourself? Uh, I asked Ron some time back to look at this RTD debt obligation so we can get an understanding of how much that constrains us from doing other things as well. And uh, so, uh, can Ron, you want to you want to discuss your what you found out there? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair, uh, I will. I will um, pull up this memo. Uh, we did we did just do a an initial review of um, RTD's current uh, debt obligations um, and included that as uh, in the in the agenda packet. Um, so I think obviously I, I believe that it's obvious that you know beginning in 2004 was not RTD's only debt issuances, but since voters approved fast tracks in 2004, RTD has issued a number of debt instruments for. Uh, primarily focused on construction, uh, equipment acquisition, and operations of fast tracks, in addition to some base system operations um, a little bit as well. Um, 
Attachment one uh, summarizes all of RTD's current debt obligations. Um, RTD did provide a, a really good table uh, showing their current debt service schedule, uh, including the principal and interest uh, through the retirement of all the current existing uh, debt uh, issuances um, organized by sales tax, secured obligations, and existing um, appropriations obligations. So that, that is attachment two to the staff report. Really good piece of information shows you the schedule for retirement of that debt. Um, Note that the base system debt payments of approximately $20 million per year will reduce to $10 million uh, in 20, is scheduled to reduce to $10 million by half in 2022 and be completed in 2024. So um, over the next um, four years, we'll um, free up, if you will, about $20 million per year um, in um, uh, debt service payments that RTD is currently making and free up resources to go back into base system uh, services uh, and, and other costs. Um, well, that's, it, if I may interrupt, Ron, that's $20 million. I, I would think the outstanding annual debt payments are considerably larger than $20 million. That is correct, Mr. Chair. That's just for that base system uh, debt payment. So that, that's you not... Say base system? What is base system? essentially the bus system so that everything that's not fast tracks right right okay yeah yeah right okay. Go yeah ahead. For, for fiscal year 21 um rtd estimated that total debt payments of 80 88 million dollars which is 60 64 million dollars for base system and 24 million dollars for the fast tracks project total interest expenses of 176 um, million dollars so as I note there, that's about 16% of RTD's total budget. Um, however, when you look at sort of uh, RTD's sales and use taxes, it's about 40% of RTD's estimated uh, uh, fiscal year 21 um, uh, total sales and use tax revenue. So um, about $263 million of total debt and interest payments uh, compared to an estimated $655 million of sales and use tax revenue total, that's base system and fast tracks um, system uh, sales and use tax revenue. So about 40% of sales and use tax revenue uh, going to um, debt payments and, and interest payments, so principal and interest payments. Um, really good news is that RTD has been really aggressive about refinancing um, uh, debt over the last couple of years with uh, significantly reduced interest costs and, and significant savings um, over time. And RTD has just recently, uh, I don't know, in the last month or six weeks or so, begun the process to refinance all or parts of um, Series two, 2012 A and B bonds and a TIFIA bond uh, that they estimate will realize savings of about uh, 76 million dollars um, through the issuance of issuance of new 2021 A bonds and 2021 B bonds. Um, is that 76 million dollars over the life of the bonds, or is that per year? I believe that savings over the life of the bonds I certainly would invite uh, Doug McLeod to correct me if I'm wrong uh, there, Mr. Chair. Yes, that is correct. It's 76 million dollars of the remaining life of the bonds, and that's on a net present value basis. So that's in today's dollars. So um, you know, a gross savings would be north of that, about $88 million. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. So, Mr. Mr. Chair, that's that's the full amount of sort of what I wanted to speak to um, as our initial initial um, kind of information that RTD has been kind enough to provide. They have a lot of this information. I did provide a link um, in the staff report for anyone who wants, wants to really dig into more details um, on um, Doc, uh, on RTD's um, investors um, web web page, they've got a lot of all this information there in in much more detail than I've summarized here, and uh, we'll we'll leave it there for discussion by the subcommittee and discussion about sort of next steps with this issue. I don't want to open any bleeding wounds, but it's it's obvious that the high debt that RTD is carrying has a big impact on our ability to finish the unfinished corridors, including, of course, Boulder but also a couple of three others so um that's a we have we have accumulated a lot of debt in building out this this transit system so 
certainly something to consider when we when you know one of the items on our on our list from the governor and the legislature is how do we solve that problem of unfinished yeah. course. That's right to, to that point maybe in part or in whole once this uh 10 million in debt is retired in 2022 and then the full 20 in 2024 I wonder, Ron or, or Doug or other folks from RTD on, is there been discussion of where those revenues would be redirected to? I didn't find anything. Rebecca certainly would invite RTD staff to address that. Mr. Chair, this is Doug McLeod. Uh, so, yes, yeah, and that's a great point. So, yes, the final debt on the base system will be paid off by 2024. That debt is primarily related to the T-Rex project, which is the, the southeast rail line running down uh, to Lincoln. Um, once that is retired, however, the... <laughs> Sorry about my dog. The, um, <laughs> the issue is uh, RTD then becomes subject to Tabor ratchet down effect in terms of its revenue. So um, statutorily, the base system can fund the fast tracks system. So the six tenths sales tax can fund the four tenths sales tax on fast tracks. The reverse is, is not true. Fast tracks cannot ser service the base. So yes, there's that possibility that additional funding from the base can be used on fast tracks. Um, it's just unclear what the Tabor ratchet down effect might have to our revenues over on the base system 2024 and beyond. Do you have good resources to, for really understanding all the Tabor impacts on uh, some of the things that we're thinking about and planning on? Uh, I, I know having run a public policy group in Colorado, it is a complicated issue and a very politically sensitive issue. Doug? <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, that is a very complicated issue for us too. As you know, Tabor is not uh, very specific in its language as to how to apply certain provisions and so when we've looked at the ratchet down impact to RTD um, for us it actually has to do with um, property values within the district that's where our challenge is is um, as you know the, the ratchet down effect is based on typically is based on uh, inflation plus population growth if your revenues exceed that as a government agency you have to return any, any difference back to the, the taxpayers for RTD, it's um, property values. So we haven't been able to get our hands around that yet, but we would have to come up with something. There were, in the last election, there were some pretty uh, serious changes in, in the uh, elimination of Gallagher too. Uh, and that may, Gallagher is, is a lot about property values and how that impacts uh, any, any attempt to increase or to change taxes. So. I, I say, I don't just look at Tabor. You you really have to take a hard look at what changes occurred with Gallagher too, and how that might impact things. I was glad to see that passed. Couldn't believe it passed, but I was glad to see it passed. <laughs> so, one of my concerns is how all of this is going to play out against when we get down to the point of trying to look at what we're going to do about uh, the unfinished border too. So, any thoughts you might have on that between now and? Next meeting would be appreciated. All right, we have an agenda to get to. Um, I don't know how much we can. We're, we're really now at a point where we're going to go into the brainstorming on some of these ideas, a little bit of which we fortunately have already done. But we have a we have a lot of brains out there and a lot of uh, storming going on. So I, I think uh, we ought to take a quick look at what some of the other issues are that we're that we are uh, scheduled to discuss. I, one of the things that Ron and I have been working on is putting together a, a timeline of what we might get to when. And part of this really uh, requires, and Ron, could you bring up that uh, chart? Part of this really requires us to think about who's going to work on what when. And as I said, Rebecca, I have you penciled in for the ideas uh, on the on the uh, dashboard, but a financial accountability dashboard or whatever you want to call it. But one of my concerns about the financial dashboard, if we can start with that a little down in the, it, is that it, I don't think when I look at, at what CDOT has on this, 
it seemed to me from the the person that we had in that was explaining how the CDOT one worked, there was a fair amount of maintenance and interaction and things like that on the CDOT one. And and I really had in mind something a whole lot simpler, basically where we captured pieces of information that RTD is already creating and made those publicly more publicly visible. And if, if you go on that basis, it doesn't put a big load on RTD in terms of people. Uh, it, it's mostly things they're already doing that that we would put out there for the public to see in a much easier to access format. So Rebecca, what are your thoughts on how we're, we might do this? Yeah, or is that the right approach? I agree. I, mean, I think it could take... Um, and it did take CDOT months um, to build the system we have. And that's because there was a lot on the back end on having data pulled in automatically from our systems so that there wasn't a lot of hand entering. Um, but if, if you kind of look at the options in, in terms of, you know, used cars or new cars, I think we could, RTD can certainly start with something a whole lot simpler and then build on it um, over time. You know, maybe a, a Honda as we move towards a Tesla. but uh, I, I think, yeah, there's a, a lot of flexibility there. And, and you know, maybe it's um, we look at one uh, area in particular to focus on transparency to and uh, use of the CARES dollars, um, you know, so other funding programs and, and just kind of build from there. Because I'm certainly sensitive to the lift because we've experienced that ourselves. Yeah, yeah, it scared me when I heard the discussions about how many people were involved and how long this part took and that, you know, just getting something up sooner rather than later, I think is so important mm -hmm. to that public feeling that they really trust that their money is being spent well. Uh, and the same thing from the legislature. It might also, there might also be ways to sort of eliminate some of the reporting that otherwise has to go on if it's all in a place where people can easily access it. You know, it'd be a matter of sending an email and saying, okay, the 2021 budget is now available online to the legislative people that want to see those things. I don't know. I'm, I am open to ideas, but I think one of the critical things is to try to minimize the burden on RTD to, to provide this in the people. Ultimately, Every dollar we spend on people maintaining and creating something new like this is going to come out of our ability to deliver services. So, something to think about. Are you going to take the lead on this, Rebecca? Yes. <laughs> it sounds like I'm being voluntold. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, we're looking at item number seven here, I take it. Okay. Yes, we are. Okay. What? Yes. Yes, Lynn. Thank you. Um, Shelly Cook, who's on the board and chairs our uh, finance committee, and I think it was Chantel Lewis, a couple of board members have been looking um, earlier in, in last year before things got derailed a little bit at a couple of other options that are uh, along the same lines, but not as robust or as expensive as what um, uh, CDOT has. And, and maybe, uh, Rebecca, I could put you in touch, put them in touch with you. Um, to take a look at what they're looking at to see if that looks like uh, something you have in mind. Oh, yeah. great. Step anyhow. Yeah, that okay. sounds good. Mr. Chair, this is Doug McLeod. Hi, Doug. Uh, thank you. I see Deborah stepped away, and I'm sorry, sorry I had to drop off my camera. Um, I just wanted to follow up too, and, and let the committee know that um, we are we have scheduled a meeting with Deborah on Tuesday to debrief her on some software that was demoed for us that would accomplish this task. And so, if Rebecca would like to get in touch with me, I'd be happy to to speak with her. And um, I see Deborah's back. Deborah, I was just uh, giving the committee an update that we have a, a meeting to debrief you on uh, the software that we've been looking at for public transparency on our financial information. And we're going to talk about that on Tuesday internally. I uh, just wanted to let the committee know that we are looking at different options currently. Terrific. You know, when we make these recommendations, it really adds a lot of value. If we the degree to which we work with RTD on them. So when you get our recommendations, they don't look like they're coming out of left field. So sure. I'll, I'll reach out next week, Doug, late next week. 
And I, I also fun. understand uh, that Natalie, Natalie, you're, you're on, aren't you? That uh, Natalie is could potentially be helping you with that as well. So I sort of see that as almost two members of our committee working to help you with yeah. it. <laughs> Good, great. So uh, let's let's go up on the list. Um, I you know given the amount of time we have, it might be useful just to sort of say what is on the list. And this is by no means a a, a comprehensive list, but I'm happy to say that. There's some things like the recommendations on legislative stuff uh, that that are already well underway. And I think from our committee's perspective, we can sort of check that off. And uh, similarly, the thorough review of the agency's CARE Act stimulus funds, uh, I think we can also say that's another thing that with our interim report, we can check off as well. So if you will scroll down a little more, Ron. Um, I can barely read this, but I'm going to try. Uh, recommendations to RTD operations and policies to achieve uh, a more sustainable financial model, including uh, review of investment policies and principles and debt strategies. That's a pretty big area, but uh, that is one of the things that was listed on our uh, our charter. As, uh, as the accountability committee, the whole accountability committee. Some of these things are are of interest to, to me, especially if there are ways that we can say, okay, here's an idea of what we might do to make this happen uh, more efficiently or to, here's an area where we're spending a lot of money at RTD and maybe we, we would offer some changes. So that's one I'd like to work on some or volunteer to work on some. Um, that's better, Ron. Uh, alternatives for regional, sub-regional funding and allocation. Governance is really, uh, Elise, as I understand it, spending a lot of time on that area. I don't know if that's an area that our committee needs to put a lot of work into or if we can just be monitoring what they're doing and adding ideas here and there. I think that's confused. right. They're coming up with a sort of a model. I think that there'll be some point where they may want to confer with us if there's some sort of oversight or input in by the local service councils on um, uh, funding for local systems. But otherwise, I think we can just defer to the governance subcommittee. Good. And then the next one is a uh, peer review of RTD administrative overhead organizational efficiencies. And this is something that we've asked the North Highland consultants to take a look at. Uh, it, it's really a matter and it's something they're particularly good at, it, at looking a bunch, at a bunch of other uh, transit agencies and seeing if there's anything that's really out of line relative to that. And uh, And so I suspect what we'll wind up getting back from them is something that we could create as a report that we would include uh, as part of the um, as part of our final report and then the next thing down is a review of fast track spending and make recommendations on can you zoom a little more than that on how bad eyes great how to achieve an equitable resolution of the unfinished fast tracks corridors. Wow, this is a big one. Um, I, I was uh, pleased to see, where did he go? Alex Hyde Wright is also sitting in on this one, this committee meeting and at least hopefully there's a potential to for whatever we do to be able to filter it through uh, to you and to Alex as well for ideas. Yes, I think so, and and to uh, you know we can engage the local communities in the unfinished corridors as well. Yeah. I know it's okay. not just Boulder that we're talking about here. Yeah, uh, Rebecca, there's one other thing in here, and, and that is uh, it seems CDOT has a has a pretty close connection with this uh, effort uh, on the Front Range Rail tran uh, passenger rail. And that's one of the things that we said, well, is, is that going to go through Boulder? And if so, can it potentially uh, 
create a solution for that. I, I have to say, I'm personally really skeptical about how long that's going to take and when it's going to come together. So I would rather not be involved in that. I'd rather have an independent view of it from other uh, members of the finance committee. I don't want to take my prejudices on that into the into the uh, analysis of whether or not that could provide a solution. What's not a solution is 2050. And so we really, I think, are going to have to come up with some ideas, however far out of the box they may be. But I don't think that we sh we're ready to dismiss the idea that Front Range Rail might be a significant part of the solution. RTD has studied this, and their analysis of it is that finishing some of these unfinished corridors is way out into the future. I have some ideas that are uh, more out of the box on this one that I'd like to have some time to just over on the side noodle and, and see if I can come up with some recommendations or some thoughts on it. Uh, I would want to engage uh, Alex and Elise in, in some of that. So there's sort of three different things. I think the first one is defining the problem. And, and that's looking at the funding and where they came up with 2050 as, as a solution. I might be able to sketch out some of that, but I'd, I'd really like for uh, Rebecca and maybe Elise to look at this front range rail and say, is it really a possible, what could, what could that do for us? Rebecca? Yeah, and you know, part of the complexity there is that uh, we haven't even fully started NEPA yet. So we're still in the, the pre-NEPA, an analysis stage with that, and it'll it'll be a ways out before we have a formal environmental study that flushes out alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think it, the the intrigue there and the possible connections, um, it, you know, should be uh, explored somehow. It's it's a uh, it's too front and present to ignore as we sort of look at this. Yeah. So it it's worth some more discussion just to figure out how we thread that needle, recognizing how much work Front Range Rail has to go yet, just to, yeah. just on the environmental study front. Elise? And I think at a minimum, um, you know, if Front Range, I, you know, what's more likely to happen, Front Range Passenger Rail or Northwest Rail, it's hard to know, but um, at a minimum, making sure that if Front Range Passenger Rail goes forward, it uses the alignment for Northwest Rail at a minimum, um, is something that I think that this committee could support and, and push forward. The NEPA analysis looks at multiple alignments. I think uh, the best alignment in terms of ridership is the Northwest Rail uh, route, but at a minimum, we should say, hey, if this is going forward, let's solve the Northwest Rail problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think, yeah. So I think that there's, um, you know, at least some investigation this committee can do on that. and. Um, and I'm happy to to work with Rebecca or others on on trying to sort of brainstorm what other things we can be suggesting around this. I think it's fair to say that since I'm from the Northwest Corridor, my views might be a little bit tainted by my geography. So it would be important to have people who aren't from an unfinished corridor to have their eyes on, you know, how, how suggestions might impact the rest of the transit system. Right. So yeah, great. first time I've ever heard of a geographic taint but it's an interesting <laughs> observation. <laughs> so among the other committee members, uh, anybody's welcome to jump in here if there are particular areas. I, I want to look at uh, really alternative technologies that like sort of the Northwest Corridor for Boulder. And that's kind of where my area of expertise is anyway. But if anybody wants to, we're, we're right at the end and we're going to need to wrap this up, but if anybody wants to jump in on any of these others or volunteer to participate in it, then just drop me a note by all means or speak up. You know, Red, I don't have a preference, but when you decide what you want to assign me, please don't make it too hard. I think that would be my biggest request. You sit down and come up with something on that. <laughs> Yeah. I think we should give Chris only hard things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Are, you, are you envisioning right sort of 
subcommittees of the subcommittee diving into some of these areas or I think that's kind of what it's got to be okay. sort of all volunteers or groups within committees and and I encourage you to reach out to other subcommittees too on some of these things because there may be if you think there's a, you think it will benefit your analysis and you got any right well yeah thank you um I, Ron said something uh, about uh, email communications between subcommittee members, yeah. and I'm just wanting a little bit of clarification in terms of what he meant and what's okay and what's not okay. It's a sensitive, tricky topic because you know that we need to be open, and we, the public needs to be able to participate and listen to what we're doing and all that. And sometimes if we go off and push it a little too far in which i probably did when with some of my asking for input on on some of these things but you know i i think i think there's a balance there of, of what we include the public i think the public should have visibility to anything we're doing and we should all be cognizant of the fact that any emails that communications and discussions that we have among ourselves it, it's also going to be public domain and we need that visibility so we well, I don't know how we get any work done if we can't uh, communicate <laughs> with each other because these meetings are relatively short and there's a lot to go through. Well, I um, think at some point in this whole schedule, we're going to have to figure out whether we need some two-hour meetings where we really dig deep into something, or hour and a half at least. Um, well, um, yeah, I am um, kind of. You know, I'm, I'm not on the front range, so I'm not as familiar with all of the uh, the issues that uh, led to the creation of the uh, of the uh, accountability committee. But you know, as I was looking through the interim report, I noticed in the governance committee's uh, recommendation there was a, a statement that said, "You know, what what problem are we trying to solve?" And and for me, that would really help me at some point when I look at you know multi-million dollar investments in in rail, um, in in a lot of debt service and high operating costs and a front range rail that might cost two to fourteen billion dollars and have maximum ridership or an estimated ridership of two million. I'm just wondering, has there been a thought about you know what the purpose of these uh, systems is in terms of reducing traffic congestion at certain pinch points or is it air quality uh, or combination thereof uh, are we trying to be all things to all people or are we going to focus rtd's resources in areas where we think it might do the most to move the needle uh, in terms of congestion on some pretty highly congested uh, highways i-25 sixth avenue Colfax, other places. And for me, maybe this work's already been done and you're all familiar with it, but I I haven't really had a chance to hear what problem we're really trying to solve here at RTD and which of, and there may be more than one, but which of the problems are the most important? You know, Dan, I'm sure you're probably very familiar with that I-70 corridor, uh, you know, rail line or whatever it was gonna wind up being. Uh, maglev you know all those discussions ultimately failed on the issues of ridership and cost and i think that's the big threat that's one of the things that makes me nervous about front range rail are they really going to have the ridership to support the cost it's an economic decision ultimately there's there's always so many good things you can do with the taxpayers dollars but if you're ever going to get them to vote yes let's spend those dollars, which I find is usually very hard in Colorado, then you've got to have a great case. Well, these are these are major investments and they are designed to last a long time, but there are a lot of things like I think you indicated, Rut, with uh, autonomous vehicles and technology and so forth down the road that could uh, make the use of existing capacity on I-25 and other highways and so forth more efficient than it currently is. And, and so I think as you move forward and you try to get public support for these major investments, it's, it's, you're going to run up against those questions from the public that uh, are 
you know, starting to feel like maybe there's some other solution out there that might be less expensive and uh, and, and and more rapid to get get in place. And maybe it's not any one thing; it's a combination of things of autonomous vehicles and some light rail, but and I know planning has gone into where these uh, corridors are that are the unrealized fast tracks promises, but um, will they still be needed in the future? I guess that's the question. Uh, yeah. Of them, which ones are the most important to do first? Well, we've had an awful lot of great discussion today. Uh, we talked about a lot of different ideas and challenges and things like that, but we're way over time. This is the most I've ever been over time. So I think we're, we're going to have to. Yeah, it's not yours. I love it when you when you participate, Dan. So um, so let's uh, if any unless anybody has anything else, I'd like to go ahead and wrap it up. Okay. That is the end of the meeting. Thank you all for being here and participating.